You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get started with this week's episode. And our guest is somebody who is tackling an issue that is immensely important to the United States military. We'll get to that coming up in just a moment. But first, some of our normal announcements and reminders. Please follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. Keep growing this community, guys. It's so great to interact with everybody. I love hearing from you guys on social media. I love the comments, the feedback from everybody. Please feel free to reach out uh, on all the social media sites. Shoot us a DM, whatever it is. Uh, email us at producer at hazardground.com. We'd love to hear some feedback from you guys, and we'll continue to go back and forth. You guys are what makes this show so much great and so great and, and so much fun to do each week and telling all these amazing stories. So we appreciate hearing from you. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. Go to our website, hazardground.com, and click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the sponsors tab. It'll re- redirect you to Amazon. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping. Whatever you want to buy. I know uh, we got that time of year where gifts are coming. Mother's Day right around the corner as we sit here to record this. So if you're going to do any shopping, go to hazardground.com first. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend. And then we donate a percentage of that back uh, to some of the great charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. Also works really easy on your smartphone. Redirects you right to the app. So all of your credit card information, everything is saved. It's convenient. It's user-friendly. Go to hazardground.com first. Please continue to leave us some reviews uh, where you get your Apple podcast and wherever you get your podcast, leave us a positive review. Give us as many stars as they allow. Tell us why you love the show. doesn't have to be a lengthy review, just something that notes uh, that you, you've listened to the show and certainly like it. We appreciate all the feedback as well. Hopefully we can crack that top 100 Apple podcasts here really, really soon. And then finally, um, more of your homework Spread the word about the Hazard Ground. Uh, let people know that this show exists. Uh, and if you have any recommendations for guests, we'd love to hear from those two as well. We certainly uh, look into everybody that is sent our way. Uh, and so don't hesitate to reach out to us on our website and let us know if you have a guest suggestion. All right. Uh, this week, our guest is a former member of the U.S. Army, and she got out after eight years as a specialist uh, and, and deployed in support of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. She is now the Chief Operations Officer of an organization called the Pink Berets, and they specialize in bringing counseling, treatment, and resources to female veterans suffering from PTSD and military sexual trauma as well. Uh, She is one of the grassroots individuals that opened up the investigation into the death of Specialist Vanessa Guillen at Fort Hood. And we welcome her to the show. It's Lucy Delgadio here on the Hazard Ground. Lucy, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Uh, there is so much to unravel and unwrap with the, with the specialist Guillen thing. Um, it is one of, those, one of those stories that if you were in the Army or in the military when it happened, you'll never forget it uh, because it, it left such an indelible mark on our service and, and the Department of Defense and all of the branches of the military um, because it was failure at so many levels, right? Uh, and, and it's something that we cannot allow to ever happen again. And unfortunately, um, in certain cases, in certain ways, it's still happening and, and it's something that needs to be addressed. But I appreciate you off the bat. I say thank you uh, for being one of the people who helped put this, bring this story and this fight to the forefront uh, because it is so important. Uh, you know, we've heard all the things. And as a leader in the organization, we talk about degrading the force and all that other stuff. Uh, it's just wrong. Uh, it, you don't have to get complicated with fancy terms. And I get so nauseated hearing the idea of zero tolerance because it's complete BS. Because if we had zero tolerance, we wouldn't be here, right? We have plenty of tolerance for it. And unfortunately, we've had too much tolerance for it. Uh, and, and I get nauseated at the fact every time I hear, well, we have zero tolerance for sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military. No, you, you, you actually have tolerance. We've had t- tolerance for way too long, and I'm kind of sick of it. So uh, thank you. I say thank you for um, continuing to bring light to this issue. 
That aside, okay, uh, I'd like to hear your story and how you got here uh, as we get some sure. support here from our staff. No, sure. Well, so, I do mean, you want me to start from the beginning of like when I <laughs> what made me make the decision to join well, the military yeah, and all that good yes, stuff? Like, but we could start there. I'll no, 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 no. Happy no. to start there. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I want to hear your story first because you know you are what we're here to talk about. What I mean, I'm passionate about this, right? Like, I am. I am beyond. I take it as a personal front, as somebody who's been in this organization for over 20 years and, and somebody who um, embraces the art of leadership and embraces the art of, of being a leader uh, and wants to pass on that knowledge to other people. This is purely a leadership issue. That's all oh, it is. Absolutely. It's, absolutely. It's, it's just parents, for, it's just parents teaching kids right from wrong. And it's leaders teaching subordinates right from wrong and putting an emphasis on it to the point where you're actually affecting things in a positive manner. It's not difficult. We have just chosen, whether cognizantly or subconsciously, to not make it a priority for way too long. And it's how we got here. And, and I don't understand. And, and I can't wrap my head around. Like, it's, it's crazy to me that there are people in our organization still to this day who haven't picked up on this this concept that dude don't do this like stop like grow up yeah and you know what really is plagues the whole issue is that it's not a discriminatory issue because men are reporting as many as much as women are um you know men being assaulted by women women are being assaulted by women, men being assaulted by men. It's, it's just an issue. It's a toxic leadership issue that is, hasn't been addressed. And, and you know, we're, we're trying to make strides and, and we've gotten very far, but we still now, you know, they put the pen to paper, but now it's time to execute. And it's still going on, regardless of, you know, that they signed that executive order in January. It's still fucking going on. And, 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 and we have to really still beat that drum and mm -hmm. beat it because otherwise they're going to just continue to have these toxic traits. Right. And, and I was just going to say, Ed, I don't think this isn't a point of eradication, right? Like that's not going to happen because it doesn't happen in society. We're not going to eradicate sexual assault out of society. It's just a question of responsibility and accountability at every single level. That is all we're asking for. No and one's look asking at the and look and, and look at the word that you just used, accountability. So let's use in Vanessa Guillen's case. Okay, she went missing. Okay, if and then nobody, you know, everybody left post. Nobody, you know, nobody gave a crap that she went missing. Everybody left post. They went on their, with their day. If that were to be a weapon, Fort Hood would have been closed down. Locked down, right. If it was a pistol. Locked up. Yep. It would have nobody would have went home. So double arm and double length. Home, Let's I've walk been the whole field. I've, Exactly. I've been in that situation where something's missing. Everybody, nope, hang tight. We're going to find that piece of equipment. And then you could go and go along. Your, so she went missing. People knew she was missing. And everybody went on, on their way. And that, to me, was one of the, one of the points where I was like, what the fuck? Like, what's going on here? There's something going on that's just more, you know, on top of this. There was more layers to this that we're not, you know, get reaching. And a little. And go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I yeah. Go ahead. And, and for me, I when it first hit news, the news that she went missing, I totally stayed away from it because it was triggering me. Because I, you know, I was assaulted in '92, and it, I just didn't want to take that dive because, again triggering me and I just want to stay away it was a friend that served with me in Germany and um me and him we do like like every so often we do touch bases to see how each other is doing and he's like what what are you going to do about this and I'm like what do you mean what am I going to do about this and he goes you're an advocate what are you going to try to do and I go right now I I don't know what I could do I, I'm really triggered and it's really bothering me and he goes Lucy every time I look at her picture it reminds me of you and that was like, ugh. and that really was like, I have to start executing something. So that was the first time that I really took a deep dive and started doing all the research and looking at all the articles that it came out. The majority of the articles that I found were with Latino um, news channels. A lot of the, the regular media was not picking it up. 
once they found her body, that's when you started seeing this cycle. And that's when I really, my advocacy changed from the advocacy that I was doing just in New Jersey. And then it opened this gamut and I joined this grassroots effort and we, and we went to work and we started activating this, you know, campaign to have the investigation of Fort Hood. And, um, and then it just took this life and, it really, the last two years have been incredibly interesting for me because I have, you know, met and, and have done so much work in this effort. I'm not alone. You know, there's many of us that have gotten our hands super fucking dirty because it's dirty work that we had to do because it's not just the work of our own stories and our own personal trauma, but trying to you know, find people who are willing to share their stories just the way we are. Because if we don't share our stories, nobody is going to execute the way we had to execute. Right. Because our stories made a difference in Mm -hmm. in this because we lived it. But especially the stories of the women that looked and had the similarities to Vanessa. You know, Vanessa's from a first generation Mexican family. And a lot of us go, a lot of Latinas, a lot of women of color, we joined the military because, you know, we don't have a method of, you know, going to college. And, you know, we are that first generation. We're trying to establish equity. We're trying to build something for our own. So we step into these shoes, but we don't realize that, you know, I'll never forget my first 24 hours in boot camp, racial slurs, sexual innuendos. And I was like, damn, my brother was my damn recruiter. My brother was the one that took me through the doors and recruited me to join the military. And these are things that, not that he didn't do his job as his recruiter, but he never experienced. Because again, his army was really different than my army. Yeah. And um and you know he he joined the military in 73 so you could just imagine it was a really different dynamic by the time he was you know a recruiter he was well well ranked and he was just recruiting so he could buy his time so he could you know uh, so he could retire so for him it was just getting his sister because i could my parents my my father passed away um, my mother couldn't afford two daughters in the military so she, in the in, in college so i went to the military to try to find you know, money to go to school. So that's why I joined. And then again, you know, 24 hours in Fort Jackson, boom, first racial a slur, then boom, 72 hours, first, you know, sexual innuendo. And then I was like, is this what the military's cracked up to be? It got a little bit better. And in AIT, you know, I, I, I had a few here and there's, but nothing that was, you know, detrimental to me. But then when I got to Germany, that's when I started seeing the true colors of what you know, harassment and assault looks like because, you know, it started with harassment and then it turned into my actual assault. And then it, it turned into my um, being um, um, let go from active and moved into a reserve service because they said I was unfit to serve. They basically drove me out because, you know, the constant making me feel like I was the one that was going crazy when actually they just didn't want me there because they was protecting this person who had so much rank over me and so much, over, you know, 17 years to a two year soldier, of course they're gonna get rid of me. And that's what they actually did. And, um, but then, you know, going into a reserve, reserve unit that was, you know, actually a joke because they knew what my situation was. Um, sometimes they would say to me, you know, prior, you know, at the time as a PFC, you know, if you don't wanna show up to, to duty, you know, for your two, you know, for your duty call this month, which we'll is tell you you were there, that type of feeling. And I was like, why the fuck did I do this for? But, you know, I did my time on 98. I was like, I'm done. And then from 98 to 2004, if you knew me personally, you knew that I served. But if you did not know me and you just met me, I would not identify as a veteran. I was like completely just done with the military. But also, you know, I, I didn't get any VA of the way my discharge took place. No VA, no benefits, no GI bill. They took everything away from me. And I was basically back to square one and really trying to navigate this, you know, hidden uh, injury that I wasn't telling anybody that actually happened to me. Because when I came home, the first thing my mother told me was like, don't tell anybody you were 
assaulted in the military because you basically tarnished your your service. So it turned into like, okay, I'm not going to tell anybody, but I was mentally and physically abusing myself. You know, I, I was not um, taking care of myself properly. I became incredibly overweight. I was not healthy. I was popping pills left and right because I was trying to control my anxiety and my depression. And it, I was basically kidding, killing myself slowly. It killed my first marriage because I was a, a total, you know, total mentally fucked up. But then I started realizing in 2014, I had a really bad um, anxiety attack that actually hospitalized me. And um, if it wasn't for my current husband telling the p- physician's assistant, like my wife served, she came back in because they, they thought I was having a heart attack. Um, they didn't know what I was experiencing. And my husband's like, my wife served the PA came in and she goes to me, did something happen to you in the military? And that was one of the first times I openly discussed my assault. And the course of action took completely different. They diagnosed me with PTSD. And then I started like this whole PTSD remedy. Um, Again, the remedy of PTSD, bunch of meds, and again, just killing myself with more and more meds. But at least I knew that I identified with PTSD. And then in 2016, I took this route of, again, I was at my heaviest. I was about close to 300 pounds. I was 298. And I was really unhappy. I couldn't even go up a flight of stairs. Um, I was dealing with, again, anxiety, depression. But then on top of it, because of these meds, hypertension, and they told me I was about to become diabetic. And that totally scared the crap out of me. My grandmother was insulin dependent, did not want to become my grandmother. So I said, you know what, I'm going to find an alternate way. So I started practicing holistically. I went into like this cocktail of healthy healing where, you know, I started to run, I started doing yoga, I started meditating, I started journaling, but I also started to find organizations that felt that I knew I could relate to other people. And that's why the Pink Berets is so important to me. I joined the Pink Berets in in the height of the Vanessa Guillen. I met Stephanie Gattas. She was part of the grassroots effort as well. And, you know, this well-being mindset has really helped me to basically navigate my day. I have not taken a med in five years and I'm, I feel the best, I mean, I'm 50 and I feel the best I felt in a really long time. Um, but you know, when it comes to the whole Vanessa Guillen action, you know, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot to take in because, you know, July 1st, they found her body. And then July 2nd, we started this petition, um, to, opened the investigation of Fort Hood. You know, July 21st, we had 5,000 signatures. We took them to the um, Congress Triangle and we had a press conference and we requested for the investigation of Fort Hood to open. And then July 29th, I was back in the Hill and I was testifying alongside Melissa Bryant and we testified in front of the military um, personnel committee on you know, what happened to Vanessa again. And then, you know, from there on, then you started, you know, the, they went, you know, the um, military personnel committee went to Fort Hood, they did their own investigation, we had the IRC, we had a multitude of things, and now the actual bill and changing it to the, you know, the, the way the chain of command, the, you know, reporting outside of the chain of command. So a lot was executed in two years, but mentally, it's straining because, you know, as an advocate, you're always on the go. You never know what's going to happen. Who's going to pick up the phone? You know, Lucy, could you testify for the IRC? Lucy, could you talk to this one? And um, I'm grateful that I have this type of support mechanism. My family has been incredibly supportive, but I had to really do a lot of, you know, self-care as well in between. And sometimes I would lay low and tell people like, look, I just can't discuss the case anymore. Or, you know, or I was always in full throttle and there was weeks on top of weeks that, you know, maybe I slept like two or three hours because we were just constantly on the go with this issue. It's unreal. Uh, All right. Lots to unpack there. Uh, And, and you kind of got it started by telling me how you got into the military. So you took some, some work off me here, which is great. Uh, But I do want (laughs) to, I do want to go back a a little bit and sort of unpack some of that stuff because I think it's super important um, to hear a little bit more about your story. So, your brother recruited you. Did you know what you wanted to do in the military or you were just going in as a way for your family or whatever? 
I, so my dad, so I am from a Puerto Rican, Cuban, um, New Jersey a family. Um, uh, my dad died in 1989 of AIDS. Um, and my dad was uh, an, an addict and he died of AIDS. And, um, you know, AIDS in 1989 was, yeah. you know, was, you know, the plague. Um, so it was the COVID before COVID. It was a COVID <laughs> before COVID. And, um, you know, and we, it really hurt my family financially. So my mom was like, you know, I can't pay for two daughters in college. My sister was a rising junior. I was just starting. I said, Hey, you know, I, I'll find a way. Both my brothers were serving. My brother, one brother was Marine. My other brother was in the army. I asked them both, Hey, you know, you know me, I'm your sister, which one would work? And I ended up going to the army because it's a shorter boot camp. That was basically why. Neither one of them said the Air Army. Force. Huh? Nobody's said Air Force. Force. Nobody <laughs> said Air Force. And I wish, you know, Sorry, I Air honestly Force. think I, I wish I, I wish, you know, because I um I did my MOS train, my first MOS training with the Air Force, and I saw their luxury barracks and how how yeah. well they were kept. And I was in World War II barracks in, in Port Devens. But um, but you know, my brothers told me, you know, so I went, I was pretty private Benjamin. Uh, I will be very honest. I went in there like, oh my God, you want me to go under that, you know, that type of mentality. Um, and, um, but I, I, I went through it. I, I went to Fort Jackson. I got out of uh, a basic. What was the toughest part of boot camp for you? For me, absolutely everything. Oh, okay. I, Cause I, I'm one of, I'm one of those, um, I was always very athletic. Let let's just say that I was never. It's it wasn't about the athletic component of it because that I had like my PT test. I would always you know I would rock that um, that. But it was everything else. I you know I could be a space cadet uh, at times, and uh, it, it was times I, I I just didn't like the you know the the physicality of getting like you know I'm like oh my god I only can wear green and those type of things and again you know I'm I, you know I'm Jersey so you know it would come out of me in that way but I learned a lot about the way you know my unit was so we had so many people from all walks of life my um battle buddy um uh, was from Baton Rouge Louisiana and me and her were just constantly getting in trouble because we were always like getting the laugh, you know, and um, we always got into some sort of trouble, but we did it. And um, it was, it was a very interesting, but for me, I think the hardest part, I, I loved all, I loved my M16 training and I loved all that stuff. Um, I actually shoot archery now and um, oh, wow. it comes into, it comes into play, but um, I love, I love that side of it. For me, it was more about like, you know, reading a map and those type of things because I'm just like that stuff is just wild for me but um it was just a really different way of life because remember I, I grew up in the 80s so I went from being you know a New York City club kid to going <laughs> to Fort Jackson I, I understand fatigue yeah when, when, so when, they was, sent yes. to, when they sent me to Fort Hood I stuck out like a sore thumb yeah like, so you're a kid was, you know this Long Island kid sitting there, hey oh whoa wait you know I mean it's a Hey y'all, you know, it was, it was, a yeah, like I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm pulling into Fort Jackson with a Depeche Mode t-shirt on, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he's looking at me like, what the frick is this? So that's, that was, that was me. And, but again, I, I really started navigating. Um, my first MOS, I was in 98 hotel, which is a Morse code interceptor. I'm probably the worst Morse code interceptor ever produced by the army, but okay. I was a Morse, I was a Morse code interceptor. And then, you know, the, um, MOS got abolished. And then I became a 75 Bravo. I went to the admin sector. Um, they loved me because A, I already had my top secret clearances because of being in, in military intelligence school, but I could type super fast because when you're an, you know, when you're a Morse code interceptor, you really got to, you know, okay, plug yeah. away. So, yeah. so as a 75 Bravo, I was put in a, um, in a I was attached to a finance unit in Germany because of the, the way I had all these clearances that I had um, garnered when I was in Did MI you school. Did to Germany or that's just where you ended up? No. So what happened was my original orders were supposed to be in Okinawa, but then Desert Storm started and they pulled okay. my orders and I got sent to Germany. So I got sent to Frankfurt, Germany, and um, I was attached to a finance unit in Hanau. And then I would deploy um, through Fifth Corps 
Um, I would do TDY efforts to help my, you know, go pick up pay problems, bring them back and solve, resolve issues that were taking place with the soldiers that were deployed. So I did that three times. And, um, and then after my third one, they left me on the ground because we were just doing a lot of different, um, we started doing more legal work. So I was processing, you know, different discharges and things to that nature. You, you um, said that, you know, like you, you went as, as a military intelligence individual and this war kicks off and then all of a sudden you're stuck doing pay and, and paperwork and everything out like did you no. want to no not at all no I was okay with it because I, I still found it incredibly interesting I I really I loved being in Germany at first I wasn't too fond of Germany um, but I really started exploring um, the country itself on the weekends I would just go all over the place you know I was that one person me and my roommate um you know, when you first get to Germany, you have like this welcome to Germany type of class. <laughs> and um, the woman that would teach, was teaching it from the USO, she's like, okay, this weekend, you know, make sure you stay on post because none of you speak German. So we don't want you to get lost and all this good stuff. My roommate who spoke fluent German, um, she was like, hey, I heard the pet shop boys are going to be in Stuttgart. Do you want to take a train? and go to Stuttgart. So I was like, sure, why not? You know, I'm going to take it. You know how to speak German. You can get us there. So we we ventured to Stuttgart from Hanau. And then, you know, on Monday, every, she was like, okay, so what did everybody do? And, you know, you know, Joe Blow here is saying, I went to the PX. And another one person went, I went to the bar. And we're like, well, we went to Stuttgart as job boys. And everyone's like, what the hell? These two going on. But, um, but I love Germany. I loved, you know, um, I loved everything about Germany, but then, you know, I was attached uh, again. I was my only, I was the only person of my MOS in my, in my unit. So they kind of wanted to start having someone mentor me and to learn more about the actual MOS. So that's when they partnered me with this person um, that was stationed in Frankfurt. And, um, and then he became my mentor at first. It was pretty cool. Um, but then I started no, realizing like the true colors of him. And um, the first time I realized that he, he had more intention about me was um, when he tape measured me, you know, after my PT test, I never made weight. Um, so, you know, they used to, you know, we didn't have that sophisticated little thing you hold on to they used to tape measure you and um one of the first tape measure tape measure he did just made me feel absolutely disgusting he um took the tape measure around my breast and just uh, i was i felt completely violated and then you know he had to move around my hips and he was like you know let me do your breast again and i was like like dude you have the measurements like can't you move on and um, I remember telling um, my first sergeant, I'm like, you know, I never have him tape measure me again because he really made me feel so disgustingly uncomfortable. And then, you know, it, I could just see it was just changing the relationship, me and him. And then- um, Did you then try to get away from him? I tried, I, we, a multitude of times, I'm like, you know, could you find someone else that I could report to you? You know, I, I just didn't want him to be in my work environment. Um, and then ultimately, um, he um, said that I failed my PT test and which I didn't. Um, so it didn't make, I, I didn't get promoted, you know, cause your PT test had a lot with your promotion. And um, he called and he's like, you know, private uh, PFC Chinea, we should go out to dinner. Um, you know, I want to discuss, you know, what happened and all that good stuff. So I tried to get multiple people in my unit to go with me, but nobody wanted to go with me. So I said, ultimately, you know what, what can he do to me? Um, so we went out to dinner and then he brought me back to the barracks and I went to my room and, and I'm like, why are you getting out of your car? And he was like, oh, you know, I'm going to do like a barracks check, you know, safety check on everybody. So I was like, fine. I never thought anything of it. And then next thing I know, um, he is knocking on my door and, and then that, it, you know, it happened. And um, it was just um, probably one of the, if not the worst, I, I, I can even recall the time because it just, it, it just felt like a forever type of moment. 
And then um, 72 hours later, I, I wouldn't get out of bed. And my first sergeant came storming into my barracks. And she's like, what the fuck is going on? Why haven't you reported to the unit? And I told her what happened. And at first she was like, okay, you know, we're going to get this, this fucker and blah, 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 blah. And she goes, who did it? And when I told her who did it, it changed. And she's like, are you sure that's what happened? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure what happened. And then, you know, she goes, you know, fucking get dressed, get to the unit. And I went to the unit and then it just became a cycle and um, nobody, I, I was never treated the same um, by the command that I worked for so closely. And then I was like, hey, when are we gonna start the paperwork? When are we gonna start the reporting? Don't worry about it, we're taking care of it. No worry, we're gonna take care of it. And they never reported it. And next thing I know, I was being transferred from, you know, from Germany to Fort Tyne, Queens. Um, and that was it. So were you more, I mean, when, when you're first starting as a female, um, and you tell her this, because obviously it's easier to tell a female in that scenario than a male, I would assume, I don't want to, you know, uh, I, I'm just assuming that you would feel more comfortable. That said, um, did you feel more let down because your first sergeant let you down or because another female let you down? Like, was there a difference to you in your mind? In my mind, I was more hurt that my first sergeant did not believe me because I worked so closely with them. You know, I was the unit clerk. I was with them all the time. And um, it was devastating because every, I was the lowest ranking person in that um, in that you in that office, but they treated me like I was one of them. And I started noticing that they were just clearly just changing the dynamic you know i would i would get in and i was like hey why don't i have privileges to this no you know we're going to give it to someone else and you know it just slowly started to deteriorate and did you ever go back and talk to her again like one-on-one -on -one and say what the hell i mean i tried to and she did not want to hear it i mean it went from where i could go into her office and fool around and and be like she was like a mother figure to me to you know i'm just you know a private shithead and she didn't give a fuck about it anymore and um and you know it happened with multiple people in that in my chain of command and and then ultimately you know when they said to me you're you know they made me feel like i was going crazy and um when they saw me falling apart that's when they started taking advantage of the fact that you know they were really trying to tell me that what happened did not happen to me and um you know i'll never forget it because they really do a number on you and it's it's like a it's a, a mental mind fuck um because they just want you to think that you are actually going crazy and, and i would say to them hey you know i you know, why weren't you here? Well, I knew that person was going to be there and I don't want to be around them. Well, you know, that means you're, you know, you are, um, you're being belligerent. And I'm like, how am I being belligerent? I just don't want to be around the person. I just experienced this with the person and you're belligerent and you're this and you're that. And I'm like, uh, I'm just trying to survive. And, um, and that, it, that's the type of culture that is cultivated and sometimes I think even when the chain of command has a woman's presence I, sometimes I felt like it was worse that you know I, I think I might have been in a better situation it was all male um, but it was it really screwed with me for a really long time and yeah. I, I, it, listen, it, I, I, I get that and I understand because I've talked to a lot of females in the military who have echoed the sentiment that sometimes females are other females' biggest barriers and detractors, right? Like be, there's older females who look at you and say, you didn't go through what I went through. You have it easier. So therefore I'm going to be harder on you because I've already been through this and you need to know how to go through it the way I did. Which is again, yeah. it's, it's that sort of hazing is not the right word, but it's just kind of like the older sibling versus the younger sibling you have to go through it the exact same way I did, even though these are completely different circumstances. Uh, yeah, it's that it's that suck it up buttercup type of yeah. mentality. And yeah. I'm like, nah, I, I don't I don't want to suck it up. Like, you know, I want. But then, you know, I came home and it was even worse because I grew up in a in a household where affection was not something that was present. 
um, you know, it, it was kind of, you know, to tell my family, again, I did not openly discuss my um, assault with members of my family till way years later. The only person I told was my mother. And she's like, well, what did you do for, for you to get assaulted? And, um, you know, don't tell anybody because you basically failed um, by, by, you know, by that happening to you in the military. And I'm like, okay, then I'm, I'm totally screwed, you know, at that, at that point. But that's what's so heart-wrenching is you hear other w- women that have these cultural issues as well. You have these issues as well. Just out of curiosity, do you know what happened to your assailant? Like what, what happened to the rest of their career? Absolutely nothing about him. Wow. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's weird. I, I have heard people tell me, oh, that person went on to go be a sergeant major. That person went on to go be a, a you know, a full colonel or a general or whatever. And uh, uh, that, that becomes even more disconcerting, um, to say mm-hmm. the least. Okay, oh, so- you, hear it all the, you hear it all the time where, you know, um, you have cases. And, and trust me, in, advocate, in the advocacy space, we've seen these cases and where, you know, hey, he retired with all his books and glory and where they retired and they got their full, you know, retirement and all that good stuff. And it's like, it's heart wrenching because, you know, you have to sit back and, and kind of take it in and say like, this is what they do to you. And um, it, it's just horrible. So now they, you mentioned they had pushed you to the reserves and after eight years um, you end up getting, when, when you were getting out, you were done, done. Was there a part of you that wanted to stay? Was there a part of you that wanted to try to write it while you were still in, or you had just kind of raised the white flag at that point And we're like, I, ra- I, I raised the white flag really, you know, early on. I was just like, I just want to, you know, fulfill this commitment that I've signed for and I'm done. And that's what I wanted to do. You know, when I f- first went in, my aspiration went to try to make it as a career because both my brothers were, you know, on their way to being, you know, 20 year plus um, career, you know, um, military members. And I wanted to follow that path, um, but clearly it did not go that way. Um, but uh, and you I never told them. No, I never told them. And um, actually, one of them I don't talk to any longer um, because he um, didn't want me to testify. It, it became a very huge battle in my family. Oh, wow. Because he felt like I was disparaging his core. <laughs> so you could just imagine that. And then my brother, who was actually my recruiter, went through a phase of like he felt it was his fault because he actually recruited me into the military. Sure, yeah. So it was, you know, it, it's that type of yin and yang um, type of mentality in my family. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's mind boggling that, again, culturally, we have to navigate the system because families and you know civilians don't know the inner workings of the military they don't know how the ucmj works they don't know how different prosecution they you know they think law is law and whatever happens in the outside happens in the military they don't know the intricacies and 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 those differences and and that's something that i always try to tell anybody is like it's a different way of life. The laws are different. The UCMJ is completely different. I just couldn't go and report it. I had to go through a chain of command structure and all that good stuff. And um, that's why this is, it became personal work to me. And that's why, again, organizations like the Pink Berets, if I'm talking to someone next to me, they know what I went through. They know how I feel because I couldn't tell anybody because nobody could relate to what I experienced. Right. And that's, and that's why organizations like, you know, the pink berets and other organizations that do this type of work are so important and are so valuable because you create these support systems that are so important to have, um, again, you know, when you're in a room of, of assault, um, of survivors, you, you know, how you feel, you can, sure. it's, it's, it's a, it's a different dynamic. And, you know, when we have these support, we have these catalyst retreats, it, you, you feel like you're part of a different world, but you have this support that's wrapped around you because the person next to you knows how you feel and knows what you went through and you could share your stories and you could make someone feel. I 
I wouldn't go into this advocacy work if it didn't, if I wasn't connected to it to the way I am. Sure. I, mean, I don't, it's I don't, it's right. And, and I don't want another human being to experience what I experienced because, you know, I experienced, you know, being partially homeless and, and the transition for me was really, really difficult because right. again, I expected my career to go differently and it didn't. And that's, a, again, that's a mind fuck on its own. And, um, and my path did not go the way I wanted to. So I really, I really sit here and say, you're not alone because there's a lot of people out there that are still experiencing what I'm exper- what I experienced and it gets better. And you just have to work in, in a way that you just have to create this really valuable support system around you. And again, that's why I do the work that I do. And that's why I feel so passionate about, mm-hmm. you know, the advocacy space that, that we, you know, the grassroots movement, because if I didn't have that grassroots movement around me, I, I don't know if I would have had gone as far as, you know, doing that testimony, because let me tell you, before I got on that, in that chair and turned on my mic and had my five minutes, I mean, I, I can't tell you what I was feeling because that was the first time I actually said, hey, I'm Lucy and I am a military sexual assault survivor. And that was huge, you know, and it took me 20 seven at that point it was 27 years ago and now it's 29 i was 27 years to say that in that in that space well it doesn't matter how long it takes you the courage is still admirable uh to say the least Uh, i wanted to ask you about your transition because you're getting out and i get the sense you wanted to run as far away from the military as possible did you have any idea what you wanted to do um i mean i've always i i I went into an admin role because that's what I traditionally learned. Um, So I, you know, I was really great with computers because at the time that I was just about to depart um, the military, we started using email systems and and things to that nature. So I used, I was able to use those skills, transfer those skills into my everyday life. Now I work, um, I, in my, I'm not just an advocate. That's not my nine to five job. I actually have a nine to five job in corporate, um, in the corporate space in DNI and and diversity inclusion. So I work um, in the DNI space right now. So I've been able to, you know, I was able to use a lot of the skills, my skill set and transfer it into, into a different way of life now. So I do work in the corporate space now. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, you get out in 98, um, when 9-11 happens, uh, you know, obviously you're somebody who's in the shadow of New York, as was I growing up. Was there any part of you that wanted to get back in and, and Go Absolutely. If and what what prevented me was that I had kids, and but but if I was single, I would have been right there. I would have gone right back in and 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 done it. Despite because, everything that happened to you, knowing despite it could happen everything to- that happened to me, because I, you know, again, we were. I was sitting in New Jersey when it happened, and um, I'll never forget it. I was in Union City. I worked for the Union City Board of Ed. Um, I was in a meeting in Roosevelt School in 48th Street, which is, you know, um, if you know Union City, it's right there in the Palisades. You have one of the most yep. fantastic views of New, New York. York City. Yep. And um, I was about to have a meeting with the principal at the time and multiple people from the Board of Ed. And the principal walks in. He goes, we're going to have to can- um, cancel the meeting, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my wife just called and a plane hit the World Trade Center. And we're like, what so we went to the roof of the school and we actually just saw this cloud of smoke and my thing was okay i have two of my kids i had three kids at this point um two of my kids were in a school in weehawken um and my little guy um was at daycare so i called my ex-husband i'm like you pick one i'll pick up two but when i got to two the school, uh, since I work for the Board of Ed, parents were coming in droves to pick up their kids because the school sat on the top of, it's on the cliffs of Weehawken and, and it was right on, right on top of where the Lincoln Tunnel makes the turn. Yep. And there was talks about this white van that they couldn't find and it was yeah. going to go through one of the tunnels. So pe- kids were being picked up left and right. So I went into their classroom and I said, hey, I go, mommy's in the, uh, 
in the office. I'm here, you know, hang tight. I'm going to help the office, you know, get, you know, release kids from school. And I did that. And then I took them home and it was just, you could see this cloud of smoke. It was just intense. But, um, you know, what we had one young man who they never found him. He passed away on our block. Um, but one of the things that happened was um, they opened um, one of the schools as like, because some, you know, some of the kids weren't being picked up because their parents were still in the city. And, um, you know, we watch kids wait, you know, kids being picked up at like six, seven. And then there was one child that, you know, it was 12 o'clock. We still didn't know where their parent was. We're like hoping like, oh, we hope this kid isn't, you know, um, it, it was, you know, his parent ha- isn't a result of the trade center. And when that woman walked in to pick up that child, the whole place went crazy because, you know, that child thought that, you know, he was ultimately going to be left there. And um, so those are the, you know, the feelings. And, and you know, I, I, I still go very often to the 9-11 uh, memorial. Um, I, um, I used to be part of, an, of, of Team Red, White, and Blue, and we do the um, Yellow Roses on Veterans Day, and we do those type of um, service projects um, to honor those um, that, um, that lost their lives. I also run for Team TAPS, so I just did, I've done two Marine Corps marathons for Team TAPS. Wow. I, just did, I just did the New York City Marathon with my son, Julian, um, and um, the Guillen family, and I'll show you because I have it next to me. Um, the Guillen family gave me the, uh, I don't know if you know that Vanessa was an avid runner, and um, the Guillen family gave me the honor of wearing her picture. So I oh, wore this on, wow. on my back, and I carried Vanessa with me for 26 miles um, in honor of, of TAPS and of, of Vanessa. So right now, a lot of my races, I, I wear Vanessa's picture. I call Myra. Um, her sister, uh, you know, I send her a text and say, hey, I have this race coming up. Is it okay if I carry Vanessa with me? Um, I just did the United, um, the United half in New York City, you know, it goes from Brooklyn to Central Park. And I sent Mama Guillen my medal. Um, so she had it in my honor and for Vanessa. Um, so, you know, I, I do that type of thing. And, and, and those, the way of honoring Vanessa and honoring those who, you know, lost their life tragedy, you know, tragically to either suicide or, or to military sexual trauma, because we have lost a lot of lives also because women and men who've experienced MST have taken their own lives because they just can't connect anymore. All right. Uh, we've gone over so much. I, I, I <laughs> am curious, you're doing a civilian thing, you're working along and all of a sudden, you know, um, you'd mentioned before that a friend of yours told you, when I see our picture, I think of you, um, you hear that and it sort of jars you awake, if you will, on where you are, what are you thinking and feeling and how do you begin the steps of this? Because you don't end up on Capitol Hill by accident, right? Like that doesn't happen. No, nobody stumbles into Capitol Hill testimony. Uh, you're either doing something that the feds are looking for you doing wrong or you're advocating for something like you are. So uh, there's a good reason why I've never testified on Capitol Hill because, uh, well, they don't want to hear a damn thing I have to say. Trust me. Uh, that said, what do you? What, what are the four to sort of first steps in the infancy of this for you? So again, um, so I started. Uh, my friend calls me. I do all the research that I can, and then my first action was I posted on social media the picture, you know, there was the hashtag I am Vanessa Guillen, and um, I found a picture of, you know, kind of like a shadow of Vanessa with the I am Vanessa Guillen, and I posted it. Um, I was doing advocacy work, very minute advocacy work, let's just say in New Jersey, um, I was advocating for VA benefit rights um, for Mm -hmm. women transition housing, because in New Jersey, it's non-existent. And um, that's the type of advocacy work that I was doing. A friend of mine that is an advocate in New York um, gave me a call and she said, hey, Lucy, a group of us are going to do a kind of like a a buddy check on each other after they found her body and you know could you jump on this call we really think you would you know be 
a good part of this call. And I joined the Zoom call and I was in awe because I saw a sea of advocates that I've only seen in articles and in different organizations. And I'm like, I should not be in this in the Zoom call. But we got to work and write in that call, we made the decision that we were going to write the petition to ask for the congressional investigation of Fort Hood. So we worked on this really crazy media um, um, post that we started deploying on July 3rd. We finished the action on the 6th um, between this the 3rd is July and 3rd, 2020? 2020. Okay. It's yeah. 2020. So, um, so July 6th, we already had uh, over 5,000 signatures from, you know, veterans, from actual uh, um, active service members, men, women, and we had enough signatures. And then we, you know, contacted the Hill. We went and we presented our... Um, our petition in, in the triangle and we had a press conference. Um, the press conference was myself, um, Lindsay Church from the Minority Veterans of America and Melissa Bryant. Um, and we presented Mikey Sherrill, Congresswoman Sherrill, um, this petition. By the time, and then after that triangle um, request that we did the press conference, a group of us went to the gates of the White House and we did a, like a, a protest of you know different stories and we hung posters of Vanessa and sunflowers because it was her favorite flower and we shared each other's stories. By the time I went back to the hotel where I was staying in DC and got my bag and sat on the train, I got a phone call from Congresswoman Spears office and she said, hey, would you be able to testify? And I was like, okay, I'll testify. And um, next thing you know, I thought it was going to be a Zoom testimony. And they're like, no, you need to come back to DC. And, um, you know, here I am. I'm like, I've never written a testimony before. Um, thank God for Lindsay Church and team. They got together and we wrote my, you know, we wrote the testimony. And, um, but Lindsay, if you look at the pictures of me, or if you look on C-SPAN, Lindsay sat behind Melissa and I, and they served as our, um, they, you know, if we had to, we, we didn't have to answer for a question. Lindsay went on her phone, uh, went on their phone and they got the, uh, the, the right answer because we were questioned in, in a matter that, not that we weren't prepared, but it became very defensive. So if you go on C-SPAN, we it became a battle with some of the congressional representation and the military personnel um, committee. But um, it was definitely an experience that I will never forget because I I never thought that I would be the one sharing my story on behalf of a soldier, right? Like Vanessa and. Um, and, and for so many others, um, because again, you know, there's been so many other stories that have gone swept under the rug that people don't realize that yeah. Vanessa is not the first, no. Vanessa is not going to be the last. Um, and um, we, again, have to fight very strongly for them. But one of the things Lindsay told me, um, they called me um, because I was, uh, I was a nervous wreck the night before I was about to take, get on the train. Um, to come to DC and they were like, what's wrong? And I said, I am so nervous. Like, why, why am I, you know, doing this? And they're like, you know, Lucy, you need to organize your butterflies because if you don't organize them, you are not going to do your, your, your justice. And we know you could do this. That's why Senator, you know, that's why Congresswoman Spears pointed at you. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, a, a lot of, you know, preparing myself, I ended up getting the butterfly tattooed on my <laughs> arm because um, I, uh, I think about that moment all the time. But it was, there's a picture of Congresswoman Cheryl um, standing with me in a corner and she was like, had me kind of by the shoulders and she's like you know your jersey like you're gonna represent us and you're going to do the job and we they want to hear your story and that's why you're here um so it was interesting but the, were you the surprised 
Were you surprised at the pushback you got during the questioning? Um, oh, totally, totally. But I, no, I, I, really, I'm, I'm hearing you tell the story, and my reaction would be like, "Are you guys serious? Like, you don't believe what we're saying? Like, do, do you think we're here?" It was only it was around? only one per. It was only one person. I, I can't think of his name. He was he's the co-chair of the military personnel's committee, and he's like, "It was my army," and we went started this whole back and forth. And then I was like, "I can't believe this man is doing this." But um, what really really set me in the trajectory that I took for the hearing or the way I conveyed my testimony was they had um, CID and the sharp from the DOD testify before us. And the things they were saying, I was just burning up. I was like, seriously, you're really telling us, you, you know, the, the shit story that you're trying to convey and you know they would ask the question well, well I don't have that information right now and I don't have that information right now I'm like dude you're the sharp you're supposed to have this information um so we we were already amped and when we got there we got on our chairs and turned on our microphones we went to town you know and for the for the civilians listening sharp stands for sexual harassment and assault uh response court uh, prevention Partner. Yeah, program. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's a military so, act. For uh, yeah, I, I apologize for that. Was, uh, you no, know, it's okay. I just want to make sure in case we, you know, there are some civilians <laughs> yeah. who, uh, who, who in the audience who don't get all the military act. It's my job to translate. Yeah, and again, but, uh, go ahead. But then you know what? What people know, so before I left to DC, um, I ABC News followed me around, um, and and that made me super like uncomfortable as well because <laughs> I was like ABC News is following me around, but um it it, it just it was really a, a different way of looking at things because I afterwards I got into my Uber and I was like what did I just do it, it's like I totally couldn't recall. <laughs> what had just happened um and then i saw it on the news and i was like oh my god that was actually me that actually happened yeah. um, and i still can't watch it i still can't watch it oh really well now i gotta go back and watch the whole thing you got me you got me curious i want to <laughs> see it from, i want to see it from start to finish you know anecdotally and, and i'll say this and this may be, you know uh, sort of make you feel good so i was called up to active duty on covid response in late 2020 into 2021 and one of my female subordinates um who was conscientious, uh, young lieutenant, conscientious, smart, bright, has a, has a great career ahead of her. Um, and she was working in my operations staff and I was running the entire task force of over a thousand soldiers. And she was, you know, there from the beginning. Uh, and so I left, left her in the job, even though she's pro probably two ranks below what it should have been, but she was hard charging and outstanding and everything else. And I remember it was a Friday. Uh, I don't know if it was a long weekend or not. I think we might've had a, a training holiday on Monday, whatever it was. Anyway, uh, at any rate, Something had happened. They were looking for some information. They called me. And subsequently, I called. I text her. And, you know, I know she got an iPhone. It didn't say delivered. And then I called and it went straight to voicemail. And then I called again and it went straight to voicemail. And I'm like, this is weird. She never doesn't respond. She's always right there when I need her, or at least in a semi-timely manner. And after two or three hours, I started to get nervous. And in the back of my mind, I have this whole story about Vanessa again. And I started calling around to the rest of the people. I said, have you heard from Lieutenant Miller? Have you heard from, uh, uh, can you text her and try to call her? And then literally when two or three hours went by, I made the decision, I have to call her parents. I have to call her parents. I, I, I'm, I'm worried enough that I, I called my boss first and he was a one-star general. And I, I explained him the situation. I said, sorry, I got to call her parents. I, I, like, I, I, I don't feel comfortable if something has happened and we wait, I'd rather scare her parents and have it be okay, then not inform them and it not be okay. You know, like I, it was, it was that sort of moment where I was weighing back and forth. If I call her parents and get them, in, I don't want to, you know, as a parent, I don't want that phone call ever. But when I called and I spoke to her father and I explained to her and I asked her, I said, have you heard from your daughter? No, I haven't. Okay. Do you know when was the last time you talked to her? I haven't heard from her. It's not like her. She's been, you know, and it's the first time I've ever spoken to the man. Um, but in the back of my mind, this whole case is sitting there saying, if I don't make these phone calls, ultimately, I'm responsible for what's going on. I can't just assume she's going to be OK. I've got to start wheels in motion if something went wrong. Long story short, she was hiking. She left her phone in, in a bad cell area and she, and she was fine. She called me back like three hours later. 
I'm fine. Thank you for being. And she was genuinely thankful for the concern. And it was a relief mm-hmm. nothing happened. But it's one of those things where it's just like without the advocacy that you guys put out there, that whole transaction may, might not have taken place. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm grateful that you did that. And, and thank you for sharing that story with me, because, again, you know, there's not too many that are like you in the space that are going to be that generally concerned for their own. Um, it, it, there's so many stories that have gone unheard. Um, one of the stories that we worked on, a kind of, it was taking place while Vanessa um, case was taking place with um, Car- Camarina Gonzalez. Um, she was stationed in Fort Riley. Um, she was assaulted. Um, again, completely mistreated her case. Um, they basically had two members of her unit. One would basically follow her and, you know, kind of stalk her. Um, the other basically made, turned the whole unit against her. Um, she wanted to stay in the military, but they fo- forced her out on um, a medical retirement. So she was medically retired from the military. Um, and then eventually 30 days, I would say 30 days later, we're trying to get her, you know, services. She could not get the services that, you know, she required because of to help her with her military sexual trauma. And then she eventually took her own life. And um, as an advocate, that crushes you because nobody we tried our best and we did a lot of work with her but the surroundings the you know department of defense the va you know the structure in place failed her you know she couldn't get appointments she couldn't get medication filled at the same at the right time it was just a cluster and um when we heard that she ultimately took her own life those things are devastating because you basically feel like you failed them um and and the system failed them you know the military the army failed her um and uh again there's too many like her that nobody goes you know it those stories go untold and um we're working with her family to get the justice that you know she deserves because the way she was treated was not the way she should have been treated. How do you personally reconcile the bad that happened to you for the good that's come out of it to others? I mean, if you told me I would give it all back to not have to deal with what I dealt with, I would understand. And I don't think you'd be selfish for that. I don't think you'd be wrong for that because that is your personal, you know, trauma that you have to live with for the rest of your life. But in turn, it has spurred on immense action uh, to the benefit of many others. So how do you reconcile your bad into so much other good? You know, for me, I I tell people I grieve. Um, I grieve the loss of the person I used to be before I was assaulted. And um, I miss her because I was a a really different person um, before I was assaulted. but again, like I said before, I, do, I, I don't want anybody to experience what I experience. So that's how I reconcile it because I know that, you know, potentially someone could hear this podcast and watch this podcast and say, okay, I know where I could go. I know that there's resources out there. I know that there's people I could talk to um, because I had none of that. I, I didn't have a resource. I didn't have anybody to talk to. And I just, again, you know, kept on. I, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm still alive. So let's just say that because there was points in my life that I didn't think I was going to be alive anymore. And again, my, my children kept me alive because they are the most important thing in my world. And they kept me alive. But I, to reconcile it, I, will I, would I want to, you know, start my life over again into the military again, probably, I probably would do it again. Um, but uh, I, again, right now, this, the work I do is tough. It's, it's not easy work. Um, 
And sometimes I question myself. I'm like, why am I, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through this, you know, thought process over and over again? But again, if I could save one life or I could help one person or I could guide them in the right direction and tell them, hey, you're not alone. You can get the right services. Hey, you're here. You know, let's work together and you could, you know, you'll be fine. You're never going to be perfect because trust me, there's nothing in me that's perfect when it comes to the way I think and the way my, my PTSD gets triggered at times. But I, I'm going to continue to do the work um, that I'm doing um, until, you know, everything is, I don't want to say perfect in the military, but I want to say that women and men are more protected when it comes from sexual harassment and sexual assault. Usually I ask, what would you now say to younger you about X, Y, and Z? But I think it's more appropriate given uh, what you just said to go the other way around. What would pre-sexual assault Lucy, if she ran into Lucy now in the street and they had a conversation, what would she say about what you're doing? I would hope I would tell myself that I'm proud of her. Um, That's something I haven't heard from members of my family, um, for my children, yes, and my husband and, and, you know, the friends that I consider family, but for members of my family, like my, my brothers have never said they're proud of me for doing this type of work. And, um, I would hope that I would, you know, stand beside myself and say, I'm really proud of you because you are giving a voice to many that still are voiceless. So that's what I would say. I'm proud of you. You, you deserve you. to hear it. You deserve it. You absolutely do. Thank you. Um, it's, it, Thank it's, you. it is, you know, uh, it, it is the work that is necessary um, and it needs to be addressed by the right people um, who, who tell this experience. And the, and the other thing that keeps going through my mind is I hear what you do. You know, the Larry Nasser thing at Michigan state with all the U S gymnasts, I mean, two decades of it went on and then they finally all came together. Uh, and it's just, just think of it, just think of this. So I was assaulted in 92. One of my mentors was testifying because of the tail hook scandal. Okay, so here I am, 2020, testifying because a soldier is murdered. So it again, it's been going on for so long and and in such pervasive ways, and and nobody has stopped it. Nobody has said enough is enough, and this toxic trait that happens. And you know, we could talk about it for hours because you know there's still issues in the military service academies that everybody kind of sweeps under the rug. Um, and those are starting to come out to light more um, more and more out there. Um, but it just needs to stop. It just the culture has to change when it comes that sexual assault and sexual harassment should not be a workplace hazard. Yeah, it, it just I shouldn't. Mean- I, I had this speech so many times in front of, uh, you know, people when I'm in command, um, you know, I, I don't say it as much when I'm not in command because I don't have the legal authority as I am in command, but I, I make it very, very clear with some choice words that within the limits of my power, I will end you. Um, and I say it very succinctly like that if it comes across my desk. But also the other thing that that I find the most senior, a couple of the most senior and the strongest personality females I can. And I let them know in a one-on-one setting, if you hear anything, you can come to me. It's okay for you to walk through that door and address it with me directly, because I believe mm-hmm. they need to know that that life preserver, that that lifeline is there. And I think mm-hmm. that's a lot of the times why things don't get reported um, is because they don't feel like they can have that. But if you verbally tell them that you're giving them the green light to say, no matter what, you can walk through this door and I'll listen to what you have to say. And You're I'll- creating a culture of safe space. That safe space is so important. Not, again, not just for women, for men, for LGBTQ community. It, it has to be created. And again, this is where the, the, tra- the, the trait of an empathetic leader is something that I always tell everybody. If you can't lead with any type of empathy and any type of vulnerability, 
then when something like this happens, it, it, it's just, you, you don't know how to navigate it. And you make a difference when you tell a person, hey, if you see something, come to me, I will help you navigate it. Yes. And not enough leaders say that to their to their, um, to I their members. Thing, I can't fix a problem I'm not aware of. I can't I, help you if I don't know what's going on. All it takes mm -hmm. is communication. That, that's step one. You have to have two-way communication with people. Um, I want to ask you how the Pink Berets actually comes into the fold for you. Um, yeah, so the Pink... It's, it's a cute, classy little name, right? Because uh, we're in Berets are so military. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, this is an organization that sort of is dedicated to this whole cause. So do you stumble on them? Do they find you? How does it all come together? So I met Stephanie during the grassroots. So Stephanie was a, a vital part of the grassroots movement during, the, you know, Vanessa Guillen. And um, so I met Stephanie. We did the grassroots um, work and I saw what she was doing. You know, Stephanie created the Pink Berets because of the lack of resources that she couldn't find when she was trying to navigate her own experience. So she said, hey, if I can't get it, I'm going to build it and I'm going to create someplace, a safe space for other women to have the proper healing. You know, she, what she's done for with the Pink Berets is outstanding. So I became a member of the Pink Berets again on the height of Vanessa Guillen, um, started doing volunteer work for them. I, I first went into the organization as their wellness um, director and trying to, again, advocate for a healthy holistic practices. So yoga and, you know, mindfulness and, you know, running and, and doing those type of things. Um, but you know, Stephanie has created, you know, peer to peer mentorship. Um, there's a peer support group. Um, again, very, you know, everything is done very privately. Um, but she has created this structure that is such a safe space and such a safe haven for women to go and get the support that they need. And, and I, I totally support that. That's something that is so, again, important. So, Last year, I was able to participate in their Catalyst Retreat, which is four days in Rising Star in, in, in Texas. And it is just one of the most incredible experiences you could have. Um, you're out there in this beautiful atmosphere with no internet, and you're just doing really great work and, you know, um, yoga classes, equine therapy, you know, you name it, support groups, and you're there for four days, and you're really working on yourself. And I came back, I was there as a facilitator, but I also, you know, found it very cathartic for myself. And um, that's when um, she approached me after Catalyst. Um, and she asked me if I wanted to take the COO role. And now, we're creating more infrastructure. We we have an archery program starting in a few months in in Texas, um, being led by um, Army veteran Leah Coriel, who's right now the world champion um, Paralympic archer. Um, she won the world championship. She participated in the Olympics. Um, so she is starting the platform for the Pink Berets. Um, so you know more to come, but there is a lot that the Pink Berets offers that is there. And it's not just Texas, it's it's nationwide. A lot of the programming is done virtually. And then a lot of the, you know, you could get flown to the camp so you could participate. So it's a really great partnership. Um, this July, we're going to partner with the Oscar Mike Foundation and we're going to do an Oscar Mike um, experience for the women. Again, we have our cast and blast retreat and we have another catalyst retreat coming up. So, you know, if you're interested in participating in any of those, go onto the Pink Boys website, register and, you know, um, put yourself in the pot to be chosen for these really great opportunities that they offer. But, you know, we're always looking for support and donations because um, one thing that Stephanie prides herself is all, all the services for the women um, that are looking for the services are 100% at no cost. Um, and that's very important for us because you never know what situation a person's in. So no cost programming. And um, again, you know, if you want to support the Pink Berets, go onto the website, 
Um, there's multiple ways you could support if you could volunteer or again, financial donations. Um, but I, I, I value what the Pink Berets does and that's why it's become so near and dear to my heart. Uh, thepinkberets.org is the website uh, where you guys can go check it out. Just uh, one or two more here I wanted to ask you and I probably should ask this before, but the final investigation on Fort Hood comes out and the military concludes their findings. Were you happy with the investigation and the results? Well, the findings, it was like, I was reading the report and saying, no shit, Sherlock, we already knew this shit. You just had to put it in a piece of paper so everybody else could see it. We knew yeah. how toxic Fort, Fort Hood was. I mean, for years, you saw I was me. stationed there. <laughs> yeah, so my brother was stationed there. My brother was there for a multitude of years. My um, my nephew was actually born in, um, in Temple, Texas. So I, you know, my brother was stationed there various times. And again, you always, there's people that always knew how toxic the culture was in Fort Hood. And, and um, I mean, when I think it was either 2015, 2016, you know, prostitution ring, those type of things, you're like, why, why is this installation still open? Um, so a lot of us read it together and we were like, no shit, no shit, no shit, this page, no shit. You know, we just kept on turning and we're like, that you had to really waste this amount of money to actually tell us that this is what was going on there. So we knew, a lot of us knew, but it was good for the public to know that this is what we're dealing with as a, as a culture in the military. This is what possibly, and there's, you know, honestly, there's a whole bunch of other bases that should go through the same investigation. It's just that we don't want, you know, again, keep it under wraps because that's the way the military is. Um, but other other bases should also go under those investigation. And I'm telling you that they would be eradicated at this point. But um, I think the report that I was happiest with was the IRC report, the, um, the independent review um, that the DOD did led by Lynn Rosenthal. That was where I saw the findings and the recommendations but what was really what made me feel more passionate was how the sense of urgency and how um, SecDef um, Austin executed, how he took this really, really seriously and said, you got 90 days and you're going to make these recommendations. And I had the privilege and the honor to testify in front of him twice during the IRC. And um, he really questioned me in a way that it wasn't like, you know, I'm sir and you have to sir me to death. He's like, okay, Lucy, call me Lloyd and tell me your story. And um, it was really, really just, again, another proud moment for myself that I was able to share my story in front of SECTA and Secretary of the VA, um, Dennis McDonough. I was actually, myself and Stephanie, was you know from the pink berets we both sit on the work group for sexual assault and sexual harassment for the va we were appointed by um, the secretary to be part of this task force to change the infrastructure in the va as well i i i cringe at asking this question out loud because when i ask it in my brain it, it seems somewhat offensive but was testifying in front of the secretary of defense sort of vindication for what happened to you? Did it, does it feel anything like that? I know it's not ever going to erase it. That's why I cringe. It's, it's totally different, but there has to be some level of, you know, if, if a then B sort of deal and B is a lot bigger than a. So I'll, I'll share uh, an interesting fact. So I just got my VA benefits this year. Wow. When I testified, I was still fighting for them. So I said to them, you are creating a continuum of harm. I go, the DOD screwed me and the VA is screwing me. And I'm sitting here in front of you testifying. So what does that tell you? You know, that's basically what I said to them. You're still continually fucking me. And I'm sitting here doing this type of work. You know, um, not a lot of people would do that, you know, because they are ultimately being screwed. So here what I am, <laughs> basically, basically, right? So here I am, you know, advocating and fighting for others where I wasn't fighting for myself. And, um, and let me tell you, when I picked up the phone to tell 
Secretary McDonough that I finally had my benefits. That was an interesting phone call, but I was able to see him in person. I was at the White House for um, a bill signing of multitude, a multitude of different um, VA bills. And I finally got, you know, him saying, you know, I'm grateful, you know, I'm glad that you have your benefits now. Um, because again, I was, when I was discharged, I was led to believe that I was not entitled to benefits and I was able to get them 29 years later. Going back to college? <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, my kids, I have a 14 year old. I don't know. Okay, if so I your kids five, are going to college. It works out. Yeah, kids, it all comes out the wash. I have, right? a, I, have a, I have a 21 year old who is in uh, Rutgers. And uh, so he's in school now. And I have right. an eighth grader. So, well, you know, they, mom will go eventually. The, I, the I, GI I, Bill I work is transferable to your children. So God bless. Yes, me. there you go. There you go. So there they would go first. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it feels good finally. I, I think that was probably one of my moments where I remember getting my letter. Um, that's, or I got the phone call first and, they, and it was, you know, this is the VA we want to tell you that you got X amount rating and they went, they walked me through the whole process. And then I got off the phone and I just started to cry. And I uh, called Stephanie and I called a multitude of uh, women, you know, players from the grassroots. And I was like hyperventilating and they're like, you know, you okay. And I'm like, I feel it was the first time I had like validation. It, it was very validating to me that finally after 29 years and, and the service that I gave this country, I finally have this that says that I, uh, that I have a, a service connection now and I have my VA benefits. Are you proud of your service now? I feel a little bit better about it. I feel that I, I, I know what I did when I was in the military and I did some really interesting things and I am very proud of it. I, I have to say, I, you know, um, if you asked me this 10 years ago, I'd say no. Um, but definitely today I am. Amazing. I mean, it really, it's, uh, <sighs> I'm exhausted hearing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm emotionally spent hearing it. Um, just because, they, uh, you know, again, 29 years. I mean, that's just, it, it's an, it's, it, it's a career for somebody else. Like you had a career, somebody else had a complete career where they got to E9 or 06 or whatever. And, and you had to go that long before you got the rest of your career again. Uh, so it, it's um, it, it, yeah. Wow. Just uh, hard to put into words. One more here. Um, you know, the bill that they just signed uh, this past January, and I know I think Senator Kirsten Gillibrand from New York was one of the, she's always been a big spearhead of the of the bill in reference to getting it out of the chain of command. They pulled a lot of things back. Um, what went up was very aggressive. What came back was very mild. Um, you took a lot of the hot peppers out and, and made it more whatever, you know what I'm getting at. So was that mm -hmm. a win or a loss? How do you characterize it? Well, we still have more work to do. We still have way more work to do, but I'm happy with what we got. Let's it's just say step. that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a step in the right direction. It's definitely a step that I really didn't think we were going to see that quickly because so many players have been at this for such a long time. And here came this, you know, you know, Vanessa, she was like the reckoning for us in the sense that, you know, it, it went full throttle. And, you know, we watched a family work with such urgency. And that was something also that the grassroots did is we did everything because the family wanted it done. We never did anything that the family wasn't aligned with. Um, and that was really, really important to us. Um, but uh, I, again, could have been better and more aggressive. Absolutely. And we still have a lot of work to do. I want to, again, what I really want to see is the execution of it. That's what I'm like, okay, when are we going to really start seeing the change? It's, it can't happen overnight, but I definitely am happy with what we got. But I, I would have been happier for a little bit more. Certainly understand that. 
Um, and part of me is, is extremely disappointed that it got to this point. Um, you know, command is the ultimate responsibility uh, of any job in America. And, and I get it. Civilians don't really understand that, but you can be the CEO of a fortune 500 company. Uh, you, you, you can be Elon Musk if you want, but none of those folks ever literally have lives in their hands that they are meant to protect that are not their own children. Uh, and mm -hmm. that is an awesome responsibility. And the idea that you are responsible for everything that happens and everything that doesn't happen. Uh, and I, I've always taken that responsibility very seriously. I've always embraced all of that responsibility. Uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown, so to speak, but I welcome that weight because, you know, without being pompous, like it's, I, I have broad shoulders, I can handle it. Like I, I accept this responsibility and I want it all. And I'm thankful I've never had to adjudicate as a commander anything related to sexual assault. I think that speaks well, either I'm really lucky or I just created a, a climate that it wasn't going to happen, maybe a combination of both. But I'm disappointed because my fellow leaders failed at that task of command and accepting that responsibility. And so we're here, right? Mm -hmm. We're here because of routine, consistent, persistent failures of leadership across the board, not for a couple of years, not for five years, not for 10 years, but for decades is how we got here. Mm -hmm. um, and I am okay with that result. Um, this is what happens when you fail. Uh, we must make changes. And uh, I think the changes are all for the better. Yep. I, I, Lucy, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm, I'm like, you know, uh, I'm smarter now than I was when we started this whole thing. Um, and, and I'm certainly going to be a more cognizant leader. And I thank you for that. Um, but moreover, again, uh, I'll tell you, I, the work that you have done, you have every right to be proud of it. And, and you and your entire staff at the Pink Berets and everything that you guys have done, um, this is, this is life-changing military service altering future events changing kind of stuff and uh, right, but it, I, I also i also want to give props to again minority veterans of america and not in my marine corps and um you know protect our defenders and um different organizations that were really instrumental in all this work because you know it it was very aggressive work and we really had to work together as a team and um did we all agree at the same time at certain things no um but we worked really well together and i'm grateful that i was in this space and and grateful for the people that surrounded me and in you know we got shit done so i uh, very happy for that the smile says it all. It really does. And if you're just listening to the podcast, go check it out on the, on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much uh, for all your time, your candor, and, and certainly um, opening up your story to all of us uh, and, and sharing it with us. I know it's never easy to, to relive those things, even on, even on a surface level. Um, it, it stays with you forever. So I appreciate you being willing to share it all. But again, the pinkbrace.org where you can go. Um, final thoughts, final words from you. And no, thank you for allowing me to be here this evening with you. And thank you for creating this platform. Um, I truly appreciate it. Lucy Del Gaudio, thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thanks. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.